This is March the 21st, 1994. I am presently interviewing Dr. Piero Foa, a native of Italy and a resident of the United States for many years. I am interviewing him for the purpose of finding out his personal experience before the Holocaust, his knowledge of the Holocaust, and of the life of Jewish life in Italy after the Holocaust. Dr. Foa, would you please give me your full name? My name is Piero P. Foa. Where were you born? I, I was born in Torino, Italy, on the 13th of April, 1911. I lived in the city of Torino for the first eight years of my life. Then I moved to a succession of cities in Italy because my father was then a professor in the Italian universities and his career advancement uh, going from one school to another. He was also uh, an officer in the Italian army during the First World War, which uh, complicated our life somewhat. So that I have resided in a number of Italian cities, uh, especially, however, in Milano and in Venice. I came in the United States in the in February, I believe was I landed here on the 24th or 25th of February, 1939, six months or so before uh, Germany invaded Poland, traveling on the Vulcania. Uh, with uh, full permits and passports as a, quote, gentleman. <laughs> Did you come to the United States by yourself? Yes, I, I came to the United States by myself. Um, my father, who was a professor of physiology at the University of Milano, um, preferred, had an opportunity, and chose to go to Brazil. Uh, the reason for that choice was significant, I believe. In part was due to the opportunity that was offered to him, but in part was also due to the fact that he had a reluctance to come to, the, to a country, to a non-Latin country. He was a little bit afraid of what might have turned out to be a culture shock. And although he had contacts in his field of science, uh, he preferred to go there. I left Italy only after I was sure that uh, he and my mother and my sister would be safely on their way to Brazil. But I came by myself, although I traveled with friends. I traveled with another uh, Italian Jewish family, Professor Artem, Camillo Artem, his wife, Bianca, who were childhood friends of ours, uh, he was on his way to the chair of biochemistry at the University of Winston-Salem. Dr. Foa, do you remember the name of your father, your mother, and your sister? My father's name is Carlo. My mother's name was Eloisa Herrera. My sister's name is Ornella, and she married uh, a uh, fellow by the name of Calabi. Did your sister come go or go with your parents to Brazil? My sister was still unmarried at the time, and she went to Brazil with my parents, where she met the fu her future husband, also an Italian Jew, uh, an architect. They married in Brazil, they had three children born in Brazil, and all of them went back to Italy after the war. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Dr. Fall, what date did you arrive in the United States? I arrived I, in, the United, in New York uh, on the 24th, I believe, of February, 1939. When you arrived by yourself, where did you go? <laughs> My arrival was a rather uh, 
interesting and, if you will, emotion-laden experience. Um, about one day before uh, the ship arrived, I received a telegram from Dr. Jacob Fine. Dr. Jacob Fine was the chief of surgery at Beth Israel Hospi uh, Hospital in uh, Boston. And he uh, was, at the time, the president or chairman of a committee for the resettlement of Jewish medical scientists, not physicians. Uh, physicians, but who were interested in science rather than in the practice of medicine. And uh, when I had, when I sought a uh, affidavit of support for the purpose of getting a, a visa to come to the United States, uh, he wrote it uh, on his own. So that he, uh, and he took his commitment very seriously. He sent me a telegram on board ship saying, as soon as you arrive, proceed for Boston. And I didn't know how to take it because I had a number of appointments in New York. I needed about seven or eight days in New York to meet several people. and. Uh, so I timidly suggested that would it be all right if I delay? And he said, fine, fine, any time you wish. Uh, when I finally got to Boston, I realized that there was no particular reason for me to go there except that his home was my home. And he had uh, come home, in other words. And to underline this, uh, this experience, I will tell you something which I have never forgotten. Uh, on the day, on the morning following my arrival, I had to get up at 6 o'clock because he, I had to go, the surgeons got up at 6 o'clock and he had to go to Beth Israel and I had to be with him. So I had uh, no time to, to do anything about my possessions and I had left my suitcases on a chair where they were with the lid open. When, and on top of my things were some photographs which were obviously photographs of my uh, parents and my sister. When I came back, I found them hanging on the wall. Uh, this is uh, quite a touching experience, I believe. Now, Dr. Poa, why did you leave Italy? Why did I, your parents leave Italy? I left Italy uh, as a result of the um, laws for the defense of the race. These, as you know, were uh, 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 anti-Semitic laws in essence, uh, patterned after and almost identical to the Nuremberg laws of Nazi Germany, and uh, that made it uh, restricted uh, the life of, of the Jews uh, made it impossible for uh, to to follow any career. Uh, in our particular case, my father was a professor, and therefore a public employee, and furthermore, in, in the teaching business, I was uh, just had just received the the entry appointment, if you will, at the University of Pavia. Uh, for a similar career, and our uh, possibilities were uh, uh, zero. That we, the Jews, were not permitted. We could have remained and practiced medicine if we wanted to, but our practice would have been limited to Jewish patients. We could not take care of any other. So it was clear that uh, the our possibilities f to fulfill our goals in life uh, had been cut off. Um, we, uh, we never felt threatened. We never felt that we were in physical danger. We were never humiliated in any way except by the officialdom. And by that I mean the 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 papers, not the persons, not the people, not the bureaucrats. The bureaucracy, if you will, but not the bureaucrats. And uh, my personal attitude at the moment and my father's was that, oh well, 
uh, it'll be a parenthesis in our life, and we'll be back. And uh, since I was a young physiologist, the, uh, the possibility of having postgraduate work abroad in the United States was part of my uh, plans. And although I would have preferred to do it a little later, I figured, all right, so I'll do it now instead of later. And that is how we then started chasing the possibilities of, of getting out. <clears throat> now, outside of the paper or the bureaucracy without the bureaucrats, did you find any personal discrimination or prejudices in your social contacts or intellectual contacts? The, uh, uh, the reaction of the... Uh, you asked me uh, a question that I believe has to be answered uh, in, in perhaps uh, in two ways, in the sense of the um, before and after the, uh, the passing of the laws. Uh, I grew up in an atmosphere, uh, in a family, uh, where there was uh, essentially no Jewish tradition. <coughs> we uh, never belonged to any congregation. Uh, uh, we, um, my, so far as I know, the last person who was interested in, in, in Jewish uh, affairs was my great-grandfather, whose father was a rabbi. Uh, my grandfather was a, uh, a patriot, if you will, born and raised in the atmosphere of the uh, Italian revolutions of the 19th century. Uh, he was uh, accordingly, uh, if you will, uh, a, a, a very strong liberal, a follower of Mazzini, a, uh, a man who believed, a strong anti-clerical person because uh, the Pope was, of course, one of the uh, persons that had to be conquered. The Vatican, the Rome had to be conquered. Uh, he was a volunteer for the army of Garibaldi, and uh, he uh, identified himself entirely with the uh, patriotic movements of the 19th century Italy. This feeling <coughs> was handed down. My father felt the same way, everyone in the family felt the same way. So that uh, uh, the, the, there was no feeling of of, um, of difference. I never felt discriminated or or in any way as I grew up. Um, the question is often asked. Uh, uh, the word assimilation is often uh, used in in this context, and uh, it is a word which I uh, believe does not describe. The, uh, what happened to many of the Italian Jews. Uh, the, uh, many of the Italian Jews who had lived in Italy for centuries and, uh, were, uh, became Italian. Uh, uh, let me see if I can express my thought a little more concisely. Um, Italy became a unified country in 1860. The final uh, conquest of Rome was 1870. Uh, this uh, was the result of a process whereby uh, Italians from all parts of Italy became Italians. The Piedmontese and the Sicilians became, became Italians. And I like to think that the Jews became Italian, just like the Piedmontese and the, and the Sicilians became Italian. From being what they were before, they grew together into... Now, let me ask you, you perceived yourself, 
your parents apparently perceive themselves essentially as Italians. Uh, when your father was quote unquote dismissed from his job at the university, he must have had a lot of colleagues in the department and in the university generally. What was the reaction of his colleagues in the department? The reaction of, of, the, uh, uh, of everyone in Italy, whether they were our immediate colleagues in the university, whether they were our students, whether they were our uh, friends or people who or vague acquaintances or people who had never met, was in essence one of indignation and of solidarity. The day that the laws were promulgated, uh, we were in, uh, in the mountains. And uh, uh, our vacation was about to, fi to finish. We were supposed to go back to, to resume our, the academic uh, program for the fall. Well, we didn't see any reason for doing it. We, we stayed where we were because we were not uh, oriented. We didn't know what to do. Uh, but when the, uh, my father finally went back, uh, the students were uh, uh, under his windows with the demonstration of solidarity, which was very noisy, very explicit, and illegal. <clears throat> uh, the man who made possible for my father to go to Brazil was there the very same day. He happened to have been a, uh, an industrialist, a man who owned a pharmaceutical firm who had done some biochemical work in my father's laboratory. And he came over there and he said to my father that no matter what happens, uh, you have suffered enough indignity and, and your, uh, your personal uh, Self-respect requires that you leave, uh, whether you have to or not. And he offered to him a, a, a manufactured position in his company in Brazil to, um, so they would make it possible for him to go. Uh, the, uh, the tales uh, would take the rest of the interview, uh, and they all boil down to a strong open, overt uh, 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 expression of solidarity on the part of everybody, including uh, people who are, if you will, quote, humble people, the streetcar conductor, the, the, the teller at the bank who uh, was supposed to uh, give me $150 in, in hard currency, because that was the limit that anybody was permitted to have, and who uh, very officiously asked me what was the reason for my trip, and when I told him, he offered me 300, and uh, on and on and on. There were only two unpleasant episodes, and both, I believe, are significant. One was a uh, the uh, behavior of a couple who were, quote, my parents' best friends, socially, a Gentile lawyer and his Jewish wife, who out of sheer fear, I believe, uh, cut off all our relationship. They wouldn't. Uh, my, uh, so that, that's one thing. And uh, who, uh, never answered phone calls, never answered letters, they just disappeared. Another one, it's perhaps more interesting, <clears throat> and is a colleague of mine, a young man who had gone to medical school with me, and who at the time was in Ann Arbor, uh, following a, some training in neurological surgery, uh, on a fellowship that my father had provided for for him, had found, not, not provided personally. And he had been in this country for two or three years at the time. 
And he wrote me a series of letters, which I have saved because I believe they're very important documents, in which he essentially he says that having lived in the United States and having seen how the Jews are unanimously anti-fascist and against uh, uh, the, the, the regime, and in so doing he uses rhetorical expressions that sound a little bit like Mussolini's own, uh, he uh, could see how the, uh, uh, the, the, the fascist had no choice but to do what they did. And if his best friend was on the other, tie, uh, the other side of the barricades, it was, uh, it was just too bad. You have those letters? <laughs> yes. I have those letters, of course, all in Italian. But it's part of the documentation of my if you will call it, with an overstatement, autobiography. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now let me ask you, you were, in your own description, you were obviously Jewish, you were not what is called assimilated, but you were very heavily Italian. Do you remember the organized Jewish community and did you have any contact with the organized Jewish community? And if so, can you begin to describe to us the character and function of that community? Uh, the short answer is, is no. Uh, my uh, experience, pre-war experience, uh, uh, did not include any uh, participation in the affairs of the Jewish community. Certainly not in the affairs of, of, of the synagogue, because we, um, uh, I, I grew up in a, an anti-clerical and, and uh, in my particular case, atheist um, environment. Uh, so that the synagogue, but even in the Jewish community, the Jewish community was something that uh, did not exist in our life until, and I don't remember the date, uh, I think it was in the early 30s or mid 30s. Uh, oh yes, I remember the date. It happened uh, when uh, Mussolini signed the Lateran Treaty with the Vatican. As you will recall, the Lateran Treaty is a treaty whereby Italy and the Vatican recognized each other as sovereign states. The Pope stopped considering himself a prisoner of, of the King of Italy. And uh, the uh, document uh, uh, describes in detail the relationship of, of the two sovereign states, uh, the mm, rules regulating priesthood and whatever. Uh, it also states that the Catholic religion was, I believe, I don't remember exactly the word, but what it amounts to the official religion of the state, and that the other religions were, and I don't remember where it was, recognized or tolerated or some such. Within this contract, there was also the establishment of Jewish communities and the fact that the Jews had to be somehow, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, um, there was supposed to be a census. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that on that occasion, I know that we, my family, my parents and I and my sister, became members, uh, we were on the roster of the Jewish community in Milano. But uh, so far as I'm I didn't know what the address of the community was. Now, before the war, since there were so many Jews in Italian life who, are so, who were essentially Italian, did they have any contact with the fascist government or with the leaderships, including Mussolini himself? The uh, relationship of the Italian community to the regime was, <clears throat> uh, I would say, quite heavy, 
and uh, very interesting. Uh, I'd like to refer you to the uh, to a book entitled uh, Benevolence and Betrayal. This book, as you know, describes five, I believe, typical Italian Jewish families. The gung-ho fascist who uh, sets fire to the Jewish community and to the editorial office of the Jewish newspaper. Uh, the anti-fascist who works underground or overtly. Uh, the poor bystander who asks a little fellow who has no desire but to be left alone. The heroes who uh, risk their lives to save other people. What it does not describe is what I believe was the more typical Italian Jewish family, certainly the ones that I identify with, which I believe was also the most prevalent, which is the Jewish family that accepted fascism because it saw in it the extension of the uh, wars of the liberation of Italy, the extension, if you will, of the Risorgimento. The Risorgimento had not been completed because Trento and Trieste were still in Austrian hands. So the First World War liberated Trento and Trieste. But the Treaty of Versailles cheated Italy out of its right, quote, righteous place in the, in the family of nations. So that uh, the, the uh, many of us, accepted a rhetoric that this was for the, it uh, was the continuation of this. And if Italy to achieve its righteous place, its righteous glory, uh, uh, the, uh, the fascism was one way of achieving it. Uh, one has to remember that the word fascism has a very specific meaning. It is not a, a dirty word as it is being commonly used. Uh, it has two specific meanings. One is this patriotic uh, rhetoric, if you will. Um, and the other one is a very specific form of government, uh, the corporations and, and so forth. They, now, uh, for uh, economic reasons, uh, some people accepted it as a form of government the recognition that this might have some merits. But many of us fell for the, uh, for the propaganda, if you will. Which brings me to the point that the, Italian, the Jews, there were fewer Jews who embraced fascism than uh, uh, percentage-wise than the uh, Italian Gentile intelligentsia, but not all that many. And that the Jews were, in that sense, not too different from, from the Italian at large, who followed the regime in, in good faith, who were not fanatics, who did not approve of the dictatorship, who certainly were opposed to all the extremes of persecution and murder, etc., but who uh, felt that, after all, something had to be done. Did, um, initially at least, did the Jews have a cunt, especially those that embraced the philosophy of fascism, have a contact with the fascist leadership? Well, yes. Including? Now, let, let, me, let me answer that question by going perhaps back a little bit. Uh, the uh, the uh, House of Savoy, At the time of the uh, Italian wars of independence, revolutions of the 18th century, uh, had an early constitution, which was called the Statuto, where uh, the Jews were given equal rights. So that Piedmont was a, a, a haven of freedom. The Jews identified with this, so that they became strong supporters of the House of Savoy 
and of the wars of independence. This is one of the reasons why my grandfather was an enthusiastic follower of Garibaldi. Uh, the House of Savoy recognized this, and they were extremely uh, friendly with the Jews. My grandfather was made a senator for life. Uh, there were many other you know, generals, all kinds of things. Uh, and the, the, so there was an intimate relationship and a very cordial one between the House of Savoy and the Jews. Uh, when the uh, fascist regime came, uh, there were many Italian Jews in high uh, positions, not only in the economy, but in government, in the army, public places. This uh, then made it almost automatic that they had something to do with the fascist regime. But there are some uh, two particular points that I perhaps can, uh, can delve into a little more because I have direct experience. I won't say personal because I was a child but, or a young man. But <clears throat> one is Margherita Sarfatti. Margherita Sarfatti, who is, was, as you know, Mussolini's mistress, mentor, uh, and in many ways uh, his inspiration, and who was certainly responsible for many of his uh, political ideas, and most likely for his uh, adventure in, in Ethiopia, uh, was Jewish. She was also the sister of Nella Grassini, and Nella Grassini was the wife of my grandfather's brother. Uh, these, parenthetically, uh, Paolo Herrera, the husband, and Nella Grassini, the wife, were the only victims of the Holocaust in our family. <coughs> but Margherita Sarfatti was Mussolini's mistress. She also became the de facto uh, publisher of Gerarchia. Gerarchia is a monthly, was a monthly political magazine published in the presses of the Popolo d'Italia, which was Mussolini's newspaper and had been for many years before uh, the regime went to power. Uh, when Margherita uh, uh, took this job, my mother became her uh, officially her secretary. Then what happened? So that uh, uh, she was very closely involved in the production of this magazine. When uh, Margherita decided to move away from Milano, where this was published, to be in Rome and near Mussolini, uh, the, uh, the magazine was practically put together on my mother's desk. So that we have a very intimate knowledge of, or experience with that. But this led to something which is much more interesting in, the, in regard to your question. Uh, in 1928, was it? Something like that. Mussolini decided to uh, put up a trial balloon. And he published an un, he wrote, or oh, he had Margherita Serfati ghostwrite an article, which was published anonymously in a second uh, class, not, not, I don't mean that uh, in the derogatory sense, but not the first uh, rung of, of daily newspaper, one secondary one, uh, entitled Religion or Nation? Question mark which obviously addressed the problem to the Jewish community, the question to the Jewish community, is your, which we can summarize very briefly by saying, is your holy city Rome or Jerusalem? Uh, and uh, the article was published unsigned, but no sooner was it published than Mussolini uh, asked Margherita to let my father know that he was the author and that this article better be known to all the Jewish leaders uh, in any field of activity and that he wanted an answer. 
So this created, of course, a, uh, an enormous uh, polemic, and we were right in the middle of it. And I have uh, quite a number of letters exchanged on this, uh, on this issue. And my father was finally uh, asked to interview Mussolini, an interview that lasted a long time, at which time uh, he was totally fooled. Uh, and, uh, and this was 1928, I believe, for the matter was laid to rest and we heard nothing more until for about eight or ten years. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you, <clears throat> your father is the one that interviewed that went to see Mussolini and was supposed to have been used as a messenger, so to speak, to the Jewish community regarding his, Mussolini's views regarding what? Regarding, uh, regarding the uh, uh, position of the Jews in Italian society, if you will. The polemic was, as you can imagine, between those who believed that the, there were uh, uh, Italians of Jewish religion or who, those who believed there were Jews of Italian nationality. Uh, in other words, those who looked to, to, to Rome and those who looked to Jerusalem. And uh, uh, it was all dictated, I believe, this is my personal belief, I'm not a historian, uh, by the uh, ambivalence that Mussolini felt in regards to the uh, problem of, of Palestine. Mm -hmm. uh, Mussolini was obsessed with the uh, idea that Italy was bottled up in the Mediterranean and that Great Britain had the keys to the Suez Canal and to Gibraltar and that Italy was therefore uh, at the mercy of the perfect Albion, as it was referred to. This is what motivated his, uh, his invasion of Ethiopia, and this is what made him uh, oscillate between Zionism and Pan-Arabism. And he was at one time pro-Zionist and another time in favor of, of the Arabs, depending on how he saw this... Uh, uh, game uh, in, re in regards to, to Great Britain. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, the, I think this was part of this problem. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you mentioned before that the only victims of your family, strangely enough, were relatives of Mussolini's mistress. How Former I mistress. Former mistress. Margarita Serfati was uh, cast out, if you will. <laughs> uh, I would say in the mid-30s. I, I don't remember when. Uh, possibly in part because he was beginning to be uneasy about the fact that she was Jewish. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, personal reasons, I don't know. By that time, he already he had already shacked up with Claretta Petacci, who was his uh, mistress at the time of his uh, assassination, and who shared his fate. Uh, so that uh, Margarita was uh, in disgrace, and by the time, of course, the Holocaust came around, she was already in in Montevideo. Uh, the, uh, her sister and her husband were uh, uh, among those who were convinced that it couldn't happen to them. They were very beloved uh, citizens of the community. Uh, they had been warned by, uh, warned by the Italian police that they were in danger, uh, asked to hide. They almost uh, dared these people to do something, and they didn't hide, and they were caught. What happened to them? 
we believe uh, there uh, the the last information that we have is from a, a Gentile daughter-in-law, who apparently uh, followed. Well, they went to Fossoli, mm -hmm. the, the Italian uh, uh, marshalling yard, if you will. I could call it a concentration camp because they were uh, sent around. And they were on their way to Auschwitz. The last thing we know is that the this Gentile daughter-in-law was able to see them in a cattle car or someplace and gave her mother-in-law her fur coat. Uh, and uh, she, the daughter-in-law, uh, believes that they never made it, that they died of, uh, of hardship in the cattle car on the way to Auschwitz. They were well in their 70s by that time. Um, what other experience do you remember? Was there any Jewish life at your home that you could identify as explicitly Jewish since, in your own words, your family was not an observant uh, Jews. I don't know that I understand your question. Uh, if you are asking me, uh, did we follow any Jewish tradition, no, such as I, a Seder, uh, the answer is no. No, what I have in mind is, did you know that you are Jewish? Oh, yes. We knew, uh, I knew that I was Jewish. As I said, we, we were officially enrolled in the roster of the Jewish community because the law required that we did so. Uh, my uh, maternal uh, grandmother uh, belonged to a, an Orthodox Jewish family. When uh, I lived, for a couple of years we lived in Padua because my father was professor there. Uh, I remember going to an ultra-Orthodox Seder that was given by my grandmother's brother. Uh, and uh, we have uh, memorabilia that are definitely Jewish in the family. I understand. <clears throat> you mentioned that you were registered because the new law required it. Uh, in 1938 or 39 it was that the law no, was? No, before that. It was, the, it was at the time of the uh, of the Lateran Treaty with the uh, uh -huh. with the Vatican, uh, that you were required to register your re your religious affiliation, so to speak, or your national affiliation. No, you were required to to register with a Jewish community to be a if member of a of a Jewish community. How did they know that you were Jewish? Uh, self uh, declaration. You were asked to to to. Did your passport have a, a no, the, no. Your birth certificate? Nothing. No, there was no indication. The I have documents uh, that indicate that uh, that that, that uh, it says the Ratsa Hebraica, but that came in 1939. Yeah, but you so. What made them know that you were Jewish since you were not affiliated with the Jewish community or with the Jewish congregation? Two things, I suppose. One is the, the characteristic name, and the other was really a self-declaration, uh, uh, whatever you like. I mean, you were asked to do it, and you did it. Uh, there were some people at the time that uh, felt uneasy about it. They wondered why on earth this was necessary. But they did it. The law required that you declare yourself and you do it. And uh, I want you to understand that this recollection of mine is long after the fact. I learned it by uh, looking through family documents. At the moment, uh, it was done. We did it. My parents did it. I never even discussed it. It was something that paid no attention to. Let me ask you, prior to that, did you know that you were Jewish? It's a very embarrassing question, Rabbi. The reason why it is embarrassing is that the answer is perhaps very naive. But I found out that I was Jewish when I had a discussion with a maid who 
argue with me that Christ and God were not the same thing. And I said, well, it's the same thing. And she said, no, and then that's how it came out. Before that, I had no. What did the maid tell you, that they're not the same thing? Was she Jewish? Uh, no, she was not. She was not Jewish, but she was trying to, to tell me that there was a difference between the Jews who believed in God and the Christians who believed in Christ. And that's the first time that you realized that you were Jewish? Yes. How did you realize it from that discussion? Well, from, from conversation that came about later. I don't remember the details. I see. But I must have been at the time six, eight, child. Let me ask you, and I hope it's not embarrassing, were you shocked when you were all of a sudden told that you have to register as Jewish? No, I mentioned to you before that uh, I, have, I have no recollection of that mm -hmm. fact. The, uh, the requirement that we register as Jewish with the Jewish community following the Lateran Treaty was something that passed over my head and I don't remember the fact. Mm -hmm. I know of it because I found in the family files documents that describe this, mm -hmm. this thing. But otherwise, not only was I shocked, I didn't even register. Did your father ever raised the issue at home regard, after the fascists came into power and after those laws were passed? Did he ever discuss at home the fascist attitude towards Jews and him being part of it? Uh, the answer is essentially no. Uh, you must remember that the laws were passed in the summer of 1938. I left Italy in the middle of February of 39, so that uh, five or six months between the, the, the anti-Semitic laws and my emigration. Those were moments which were so, uh, we were so uh, concerned with what to do next that we really never discussed these matters. So he, the, uh, it is very difficult for me to describe the reaction that I felt that many of my friends, Jewish friends felt, some of my relatives who are in the United States felt, uh, we were stunned. We were, uh, what I can best describe in a state of suspended animation. We didn't feel threatened physically. Uh, we didn't feel humiliated morally because nobody spat in our face or did anything uh, that was derogatory. Uh, yet we knew that we no longer were what we had, to, had been before. And uh, it was a, a very peculiar sensation. We felt that it, it, it was a storm that, all right, it'll come and go. Mm -hmm. Your father left for Brazil, you left for the United States. Were you in contact with your dad during the war? Yes. We were in constant contact. I uh, used to write letters practically every week. Uh, we went to visit them. When was it? In 1941. As soon as, as, soon as the war was over. As soon as the war was over, we went to Brazil. We spent three months in, in Sao Paulo visiting them. During the war, were you aware of what's going on with the Jews in Italy? No. During the war, when I was here, when I came, uh, I was, of course, an, an, uh, an enemy alien. I didn't become a citizen until the five years, legal years passed. So it was 1945, <coughs> 44, 45. During that time, I, I tried to volunteer and I was rejected. Turned down first. Uh, I applied to the Navy and they said, no, 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 no alien needs to apply. You have to be a Native American. Even a Canadian was not acceptable. Her brother was born in Canada and he had a heck of a time getting, uh, getting into the Navy. 
Then I, uh, the army rejected me on, on the basis of uh, physical examination. Then when that was over, uh, by that time I was uh, in a position where they wouldn't let me go. So I did not participate in any way in, in the war. I uh, was not aware of what was going on. When you met with your father after the war, did he touch at all the subject of Jewishness and what happened to them during the war? No, I don't think that uh, the, the, uh, the, the major concern that my father uh, had and addressed was uh, was the question of Italian identity, not Jewishness. Uh, you may recall that one of the first, or perhaps the first, official act of the new Italian Republic after the war <coughs> was to reinstate uh, full civil rights to the Italian Jews who had been deprived of it. Restitution of, of property and all the rest of it. That included restitution of jobs for anyone who had been a public employee uh, by law and strong pressure of restitution of job in the private sector. Now my father had been a professor so he automatically uh, was uh, reinstated in his position. Not only that, but they added the five years that he had missed to his retirement age. So that instead of retiring at 70, he retired at 75. Uh, so the whole discussion was about the return into the family of Italy and the re resumption of a life that had been interrupted. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that your father became or didn't become more Jewish con conscious as a consequence of these experiences? The answer is no, not in the least. And I, I, uh, uh, I don't mean Jewish conscious in a religious context. No, 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 I understand what you mean. Jewish identity. Yeah. No. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, if anything, he uh, redoubled his Italian, the feeling of uh, Italian identity. Well, what, there's no, there must be an Italian word, a, a word. Uh, equivalent to Jewishness, for referring to Italy, but I can't think of it now. <laughs> Italian identity is this. Um, you have been in the United States since 1939. You have seen what happened in the United States, but particularly you must have been conscious of what's happening in Italy because your parents went back to Italy. And your father lived there after the war. Did you find any shock when you found out that uh, some of your family were actually murdered during that period because they were Jewish? Well, of course. Uh, there is more to it. It's not, not only that my father and my mother and my sister and her family went back to Italy, but I resumed my contacts with my colleagues and went back to Italy uh, in the average at least, more, certainly more than once a year. Over, over many, many years. Uh, my uh, uh, 
I, at the time, uh, had become professor of physiology at the Chicago Medical School. I was fortunate enough to be supported with generous grants from the NIH for my research. Uh, and at the time, uh, the uh, limiting factor in spending the money was manpower. And uh, the, the um, trained young people to come and work in the sciences were hard to come by. And one of the ways that I remedied the situation was to, to get young scientists from Italy and other countries. And I had, uh, instead of basing my selection on, on iffy letters of recommendation, uh, I had my father, who, who was at the University of Milano and who knew these young men, select uh, young people. Uh, and uh, um, so that over the years, I had a number of Italian scientists who worked with me. These people have since made brilliant careers, most of them. And they are, uh, in their turn, chairman of various departments in the Italian universities. And they invite, invited me uh, to go back so that I have served as a visiting professor in Italian universities uh, at least uh, six or seven or eight times during the year so that I have maintained a constant contact with, uh, but it is my, uh, my uh, relationship with Italy is really more in the academic world than it is in the, in the Jewish world. Let me ask you. Sorry? Let me ask you a question. Your father, from your words, and I presume your mother the same, felt Italian. The Italians consider him Jewish. at least a segment of the Italians consider him Jewish. For example, let me give you an example. You mentioned before your very best friend in school went to an Arbor, was here a few years. He found out that the Jews in America are against fascism. Therefore, he no longer blamed the Italians for doing what they did. But he must have also found out that the Italians in America are against fascism. Yet he did not well, uh, blame the Italians in Italy. All right. So Let apparently he, while you may have considered to be an Italian, he considered you to be a Jew nonetheless. I think that I have to uh, uh, debate two statements that you made. One is uh, that some of the Italian considered you a Jew. The examples that I gave you were not selected, were the two examples that I know of, which emphasize the fact that, uh, by and large, uh, your premise is not, is not correct. Uh, the second one I also question. Uh, the Italian community here, uh, although there were many anti-fascists, by and large were not. And, uh, and I remember, I don't remember because I wasn't here, but I was told that during the Ethiopian war when the, uh, the Italians sent gold leaf to, to Mussolini, postcards with, with gold on it to, to, to support the, the fascist regime. Um, the, um, the, the situation is, is, my father never felt, when I go back to Italy to this day and I visit all my Gentile friends in the academic world, uh, the thought, uh, I, can, I can make with them, I can indulge with them in Jewish jokes. And we can trade jokes, Catholic jokes, Jewish jokes, it's all part of the family. No, no... Uh, modesty or no reluctance about making a Jewish crack in, in, in the academic environment. I don't know that I would do it everywhere, but uh, I feel perfectly at ease. So but the, 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 the community, the Jewish community in Italy is no longer the same. Now what happens now is another story which I don't know that I can address intelligently because uh, 
the, the uh, cultural, economic, and if you will, ethnic uh, composition of the Italian Jews in Italy has changed. But all in all, you must, I would assume that you must have sensed that they know, obviously those that were in, in sync politically with you wouldn't think of you that you are Jewish. But if you would be not in sync politically with them, do you think they would consider the additional fact that you are Jews? I presume so, but I, I have no way of answering your question uh, in, in a direct, in, in an intelligent way. Uh, one of the uh, persons that I, uh, was a friend of mine when we were kids, was uh, Natalia uh, Levy Ginsburg, the, the famous writer, uh, who lost a, a husband to the to the uh, goons of fascism, whose father was arrested, whose brother were arrested. And uh, there were at the time, of course, the, the one of the classic uh, favorite statements of, of the uh, anti-fascist gang, anti-Semitic gang that surrounded Mussolini was the long hyphenated word to describe the enemies of, of uh, the, the, the Jewish, uh, uh, communist, uh, liberal, um, et cetera, et cetera.